Hi class, welcome to part two of the Energy and Enzymes lecture. Uh, when we last left off, we finished just at this slide here talking about free energy. Okay, so um, you've already learned that there are two kinds of energy, right? There's two kinds of energy. There's potential energy and there's kinetic energy. You've learned about that since you were maybe in third grade. Okay, but now I'm going to open your mind a little bit. There's two real other kinds of energy. There's basically, there's useful energy, energy that lets things do work. So like moving a ball. And then there's energy called thermal energy, where it's just the molecules vibrating around, doing nothing useful. Okay, so remember we talked in class that everything's kind of jiggling in the universe, right? Everything has its own amount of kinetic energy. And so everything's just jiggling. You can't put that kind of energy to work, but it's there. Okay, so there's two kinds of energy in a given system. There's the useful energy and useless energy. Another way of saying that is the free energy of a system and the thermal energy of a system. Ther uh, thermal, thermal energy. Okay, think of it as heat. So things get hot, they move faster. Things get cold, they move slower. Okay, now the guy that discovered this name was Willard Gibbs, and so we call it Gibbs free energy. Okay, so that's where the G comes from. And then this delta, you've probably seen that before in math class. You're talking about like slopes of a line, the change in X divided by the change in Y, right? This delta usually means change. So we're talking about a delta G, we're talking about a change in free energy of a system. Okay, now we don't know how much total energy a system has. We just know how much it changes. So the equivalent of that would be, let's say you gave me $100. Okay, I now have $100 more in my bank account, but you don't know what the total amount of money is in there, right? So you can just say it's like X plus some $100. X plus $100. Okay, now let's bring this concept of free energy down into the chemistry, okay? So if we talk about a reaction, say like A plus B yielding C, okay? Now let's say that A and B getting put together to make C require some amount of energy, right? We're building it, we're going uphill. Okay, this would be like taking maybe two Lego blocks and clicking them together. Okay, so we have, we're building stuff, we're, we're gaining structure, we're decreasing the entropy, right? We're increasing the order, we're going uphill, that is not spontaneous, okay? And we call those kinds of reactions ender. Endergonic. And the reason we call those endergonic is because they're absorbing energy. Remember ender, like endocytosis, bringing things into the cell? Well, now we're endergonic, we're bringing energy into the system, okay? So a real-world example of this we'll talk about more later is so adenosine diphosphate plus some phosphate goes uphill. We're going to push the phosphate group here onto that molecule and yield adenosine triphosphate, a high-energy molecule. Okay, so ADP is low in energy compared to ATP, so we're going uphill. All right, now we can consider any reaction, okay, A plus B yielding C, as an overall change in free energy that's either plus or minus, okay? If it's plus delta G, what we mean by that is the system is gaining energy right? It's gaining energy. That's the endergonic reaction. That's not spontaneous. That's going uphill. That's putting work in. Okay. So plus, plus delta G is gaining energy, going uphill. When things fall apart, go downhill, give up energy as they fall. Okay. Then we call that an exergonic reaction. Okay. Exergonic meaning giving up Okay, exiting the system. That's another way of thinking of it. The energy is exiting the system. These are spontaneous reactions, okay? Spontaneous reactions. These are reactions that do not require an input of energy, okay? And so we would call these negative delta G. They're giving up their energy, all right? So one simple way of combining all that now is we have um, reactions that are positive in delta G, Okay, and we have other reactions that are negative in delta G. And see what I did there? I just reversed that same reaction. Remember that chemical reactions are reversible. So A plus B yielding C, okay, if that's an input of energy, then if we go from C and degrade it down into its parts, A and B, we're going to give up energy, okay? All right, 
So now let's think about in the cell, cells have lots and lots of this stuff we've talked about. ATP, this is what lets our cells do work. Well, how does it let us do work? Well, imagine ATP giving up energy as it falls downhill to ADP, okay? So it gives up some energy there, energy. Okay, now imagine we're taking some amino acids and we're building a protein into a chain, right? So we're building things, so we need energy for that. Well, guess what? Here's your energy source, right? So the exergonic reaction of ATP going down to ADP is coupled, that's the key here, oops, it's coupled to the endergonic reaction, okay, of, in this case, building a protein. But imagine this being any of the cellular work we've talked about all semester, okay? So basically, we're breaking things down to build them up. So over here now, from the mathematics of this, you see here, uh, the plain English says, if delta G is equal to zero, okay, then that means the reaction is, you know, neither spontaneous or non-spontaneous, it's neutral. However, if the delta G is greater than zero, okay, if the free energy gained by this system is some positive number, that means we've gained energy, so that would be an endergonic, I'm sorry, yeah, endergonic, Okay, that would be, that would be a, hold on, I, I sometimes confuse myself in these. We're gaining energy into the system. Yeah, endergonic, it's plus delta G. Okay, and likewise, reactions that are negative in delta G, they're leaving the system, the energy is leaving the system, that's an exergonic reaction, that's negative delta G. Okay, all right, so let's get started here now. I just said all this, so let's just uh, make sure we are clear on what this slide tells us. These are just definitions here. So exergonic reactions are ones where the energy is released, okay? So this would be the example of, say, ATP um, being hydrolyzed to ADP plus phosphate, okay? So this reaction gives up energy. And so we would say this is negative delta G, okay? And then endergonic reactions are inputs of energy. Right? They require an input of energy. So that would be the example of making ATP. So we take ADP plus phosphate and we make ATP. Okay? All right. So here's my question to you. I want you to think of some exergonic reactions and some endergonic reactions. They don't have to be inside the cell. Think of your everyday life. Maybe think of cooking or thinking of driving your car or walking out in nature. Think of leaves falling. Think of having to rake leaves maybe. Okay, there's lots and lots of energy transformations happening all around us. And some of those energy transformations give off some energy and some of it gains some energy or needs some energy. All right, we've already talked about ATP a bit this semester. Let's just formalize this. So the ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Okay, now adenosine triphosphate is basically... So first of all, it's one of the building blocks of RNA. Okay, so not DNA. So it is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it is built from a five carbon sugar. So this here, one, two, three, four, five, there's your five carbon sugar. That's ribose, okay? And that's just the carbon backbone, of course. And then attached to the first carbon here, this is the one carbon. This is where you would have some nitrogenous base, some fancy structure that has um, a carbon backbone, and so in this case, this would be, oops, that's weird, this would be the nitrogenous base adenine, okay? So, and then over here on the five prime carbon, we would put one, two, three phosphates, okay? So there's your three phosphates or your triphosphate, and then the adenine, when it is attached to a sugar and phosphate together, we call this whole molecule, not adenine, but adenosine and that's where the ATP comes from, okay? And in one of the next chapters, we're gonna learn how we make ATP by burning glucose, okay? You can imagine there, so therefore glucose falling downhill to what makes it up, the carbon dioxide and the water that plants use to make it, okay? So as glucose falls, it gives off energy, and we can use that energy to build the ADP up into ATP, okay? So there's an example of coupling. This is cellular respiration. We'll learn about that later. So here's just a nice diagram of what we can call the ATP cycle. So this is a generic um, uh, diagram that just shows the basic behavior of ATP. So this molecule here, that's your 
adenosine triphosphate. There's ribose, okay? In this case, they swapped it around from when I drew it last time. But you know, these are 3D objects, that's fine. This is adenine, okay, ribose, and then the three phosphates. The energy in here, you can picture it, all these phosphate groups have tremendously uh, highly energetic electrons that basically cruise around the entire molecule. So this whole thing is this big, hot, very unstable, very, very um, reactive molecule we call ATP. Okay, and so you can see here, as ATPs um, uh, use in a reaction, so for example, an enzyme might grab it and then rip this phosphate off, break that bond, Okay, so you can see here it's being broken. And as that bond is broken and the products are made, okay, those bonds that are made are able to use the energy from this break to make it. Okay, so we break this to make whatever's happening over here. So you can see here, this arrow is going to some other reaction, whatever that is, building proteins, synthesis pathways, moving things, whatever, okay? Now likewise, some energy has to come into this right, in order to bring the ADP, so this here, this is your ADP, okay, and remember we've discussed, English is kind of limiting when it comes to learning this stuff, right, the, there's no relationship between that D in the ADP and the T in the ATP, these are the same molecule, okay, these are the same molecule with the exception of there's a phosphate attached to the TP and there's no phosphate attached to the DP, or I should say there's one less uh, phosphate, one fewer phosphate attached to the DP, right? Now you can imagine too, since we're here, if I broke this bond, okay, so this is ADP, if I broke that bond and I ripped off another phosphate, you can imagine that going and becoming adenosine monophosphate, okay? So there's this thing called AMP too, right? So there's no relationship again between that M, the D, and that T. So try hard to imagine these things as what they are, these objects, these organic molecules, and less about the English behind them, okay? All right, let's move on. So I already went through this, but again, so ATP, adenosine triphosphate, that is the ribose sugar, okay? That is a five carbon sugar, and you can kind of draw it like the Big Dipper. You can draw, uh, hold on, here's the Big Dipper. Let's try that again. There's the Big Dipper. Okay, and then you can imagine that there's something falling into the Big Dipper. Okay, so there's the oxygen. Okay, so this here, that's the five prime, the four, the three, the two, and the one. Those are the sugars of the ribose. I'm sorry, the carbons of the ribose. Okay, and then attach the one prime, that's where we have a nitrogenous base. And that could be um, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, right? And um, well, rather, because this is just plain old ribose, this is the RNA sugar, right? We don't have thymine, right? We actually have uracil, okay? Whereas in DNA, the only difference between DNA and RNA we talked about earlier is this carbon right here um, in DNA, it has um, no oxygen there, right? We deoxify it. So we go from ribose to deoxyribose. But the ribose in RNA, Okay, the RNA, the R in RNA is ribose, and that's a sugar with all of its hydroxyl groups. There's an OH here, there's an OH here. And so in DNA, DNA is deoxyribose, and so in deoxyribose, this hydrogen, I'm sorry, this hydroxyl group is not there anymore. It's just a plain old hydrogen, okay? All right, so again, ATP is the primary energy carrier of cells that allow cells to do work and go uphill, okay? Basically, um, countering chaos, um, going uphill, decreasing entropy, right? These are all words you should be comfortable with by now. All right, so we talked about this already too. Um, what do we do with the ATP? Well, you can imagine that there are some enzymes, right, that convert things and build things. So there's enzymatic pathways metabolic pathways, and so the enzyme, that's not energy by the way, that's an enzyme, enzyme can use ATP as a cofactor, right? So something that helps the enzyme, but it does get used up. So ATP is used by an enzyme to build things. So we call that chemical work, right? So when we're building things in the cell, we call those anabolic pathways, okay? If you recall, the metabolism 
metabolism is divided into building and breaking reactions, right? So the breaking reactions are catabolic. And the way you can remember that is what a cats do, right? Cats break and destroy. And you have anabolic, right? And the way to remember that is perhaps there's a, a wonderful little five-year-old girl who is building with Lincoln Logs, and she's building a big castle out of the Lincoln Logs. So Anna builds. So anabolic builds and catabolic breaks. All right, in addition to building and breaking things, we can move things, right? So if you remember the cell, here's a cell in the nucleus. You can remember there's the Golgi and the ER and all that good stuff. And so we have all this vesicle traffic, right, moving in and out. We have exocytosis and endocytosis, all that stuff require some work. Also remember in the cell membrane, right, remember we have that sodium potassium pump, the NAK pump, right, from the other chapter, the cell membrane chapter, we learned about how um, we pump three sodiums out for two potassiums in, and that gives us an overall net charge here of negative, right? So that's work by establishing this gradient, this charge gradient. Let's transport work. And then, of course, there's mechanical work, right? So remember your bacterial cells have your little flagella, and so this flagella here beats and it allows it to move, okay? Um, our muscles contract, you're using them when you walk, so there's mechanical work, okay? So remember, work is moving matter, and in order to do work, you need energy, okay? And so there's different kinds of energy and different kinds of work, okay? And you can see there's a relationship between those. So you can imagine there's chemical energy, does chemical work. Mechanical energy does mechanical work. Um, and I guess you can construe that um, uh, transport energy would probably be a form of mechanical energy, right? So, so there we go. All right, so we talked about coupling before. Now you can really hopefully understand this. We take the exergonic reaction, the reaction that gives off energy, right? And so ATP having its phosphate ripped off that gives off, rather, that gives off energy. And what do we do with that energy? We put it into a reaction that needs it, okay? Coupling, perfect. So for example, okay, myosin is a protein that lets our muscles move, okay? So you can see here, this area here, this is a big, big cluster of proteins called myosin. Individually, myosin you can think of looks kind of like this. Okay, it's like a long filament with a little bulb, bulbous head. Um, and when it binds to ATP, it causes the head to move this way. So it goes from like this to like this. And because the head's bound to some actin filaments, it pulls them along. Okay, think of like a tug of war going on. Okay, so the hydrolysis of ATP, breaking that ATP to ADP, okay, so going downhill, allows us to go uphill by moving the myosin head. And of course, there's millions and millions and millions of these things happening all at the same time, and so that's what allows the muscle fiber to contract. Okay, and so there's the contraction. You can see now that the release of ADP and the phosphate causes the myosin to change shape again and pull against the actin. Okay, so we go from one shape to another shape, and by allowing the ATP to become ADP, okay, so here we go. As you can see, they represented by three triangles here. Okay, so one of the triangles falls off. You can see here's the phosphate. That's attached to the myosin. That causes the change in shape. So you can see the myosin's like this, and now it's bent up a little bit more. Okay, and notice the ADP is still bound to it. <clears throat> in this picture, you can see the ADP and the phosphate's falling off. Okay, they dissociate. And as they fall off, that causes a change in shape again. Okay, and so when ATP binds again, it'll cause the shape to change um, going back to the last direction, right? So, so to recap, it's in this position, and then it gets phosphorylated, ADP um, gives it its phosphate group, okay? And then it releases, it makes it even more extreme. And what they don't show you in these pictures for some reason is the relaxing, okay? Going back to the default state. But it's okay. You know, I'm not going to ask you any questions on the details of how muscles work. The idea here is just there's a coupled reaction. There's the breaking of ATP allows the change in shape of myosin. Really, that's the bottom line here. Okay? Okay. So we've also talked about this in class, but let's review metabolic pathways. Okay, metabolic pathways are basically a series of metabolic reactions. A metabolic reaction is simply a chemical reaction that is mediated by an enzyme. Okay, 
And so in this basic reaction, we can see two substrates. Okay, substrates are reactants that um, bind to enzymes. Okay, so two substrates um, come together and the enzyme acts upon them and it creates this whatever C is. It doesn't matter what these things are. Okay, now we would call therefore C the product and A the reactant and B the reactant. Okay, or the substrate and the substrate. Okay, now, but let's say that instead we had A plus B with enzyme 1 creating C, yielding C. And then let's say that there's another enzyme that takes C, so we'll call that enzyme 2, and makes it into D. Okay, so even though we can imagine this is reaction 1, okay, we can see this is reaction 2. Right, that's metabolic reaction 1 and 2. And so we can see now they're joined together. So C becomes the, uh, which was the product in the first reaction, becomes the substrate in the second reaction. Okay, and so you can see here D is the final product. So because D is the final product of the overall pathway, we would also call C, in the context of the overall pathway, the intermediate because it's in the middle there. Okay, so metabolic pathways are basically linked reactions. Okay. All right, we've already talked a lot about enzymes, so I'm going to gloss over this. But basically, as you know already, enzymes are proteins. Keep in mind, okay, that generically they are catalysts. And remember that a catalyst, um, and if you don't have this in your notes, make sure you put this in there. A catalyst is a um, substance that increases the rate of a chemical reaction but does not get used up in the process, right? And so in biology, there are proteins that can act like a catalyst, okay? And a protein catalyst, therefore, is an enzyme. However, there are other biological catalysts, one being there are some RNAs that can be a catalyst. So an RNA catalyst is called a ribosome. And a ribosome, we're really hardly going to talk about. The only time ribosomes will come up later in the semester is when we are doing translation, when we're making proteins. Okay, so you don't have to worry about ribosomes too much. Okay, let's see. So this slide here is talking about an overall metabolic pathway, and you can see again, so we would say A is the substrate or the starting materials, G is the product, and then B through F are all intermediates. Okay. All right, now there's this uh, concept called activation energy. Most students struggle with this because they have no real good tangible example of it. So here's this very simple example. You have a table. Okay, here's a table. And forgive my drawing here. This is still not easy to do. But here's a table, and here's a ball on top of the table. Okay, that ball, you would say, has some potential energy in it because it's far off the ground. There is some distance here. And so we could relate that to gravity and the acceleration of gravity. And so as the ball would fall down, it would give up some energy, right? But the ball's not doing that right now. It's just kind of hanging out there. So we need to activate it, right? So what do we do? We take our finger and we just pop it, boop, and then the ball falls off, okay? So without that tiny little bit of energy, we call the energy of activation, okay, or E sub A, Without that little bit of energy, the reaction won't be able to go, okay? Some real-world examples, well, like this slide talks about a match to start burning wood, right? I mean, if you think about it, burning wood itself, wood burning, is a spontaneous reaction, right? It goes downhill, it gives up energy, you don't have to put energy into it, but you do have to put a little energy in to start it, okay? What other examples can you think of in your real life to come up with? Uh, what other examples in real life can you come up with for uh, activation energy? Okay, I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about that. Okay, how about, how do you get from point A to point B? How do you get there? You drive, right? So how do engines work? Think about spark plugs, and I'll leave it at that. Okay, so feel free to pause and kind of chew on that a bit, and then come back. All right, so this is a diagram that kind of just shows you the mathematics of this. Okay, so to understand this diagram, first understand, if we go this way, that is time, okay, the progress of the reaction. So as time goes on, that's that way. And then up here, this is the amount of free energy the system has. Remember that free energy is that bit of energy that the system can uh, give off or take in that does work, all right? So you, if you imagine this as an actual hill, okay, so imagine a hilltop where there's a little rise, 
Okay, there's a bump, and then it falls all the way down, and let's say that there's, you know, there's some trees down here. Okay, and this is a ball. Okay, it's, again, it's like a soccer ball. So imagine the soccer ball, in order to get the soccer ball to go down here, and to release its energy, you have to get over this hump, right? So you can imagine, let's say it's a windy day, you can imagine that ball rocking back and forth here, but it's not going to be able to get up here unless the wind is really strong, right? And so you would call this, um, this, this need to put energy in the activation energy, okay? So when you look at the blue line here, okay, the blue line, this is going uphill. This is the amount of energy you need to get the reaction going all by itself. Okay, so you can imagine from here to here, right? That's the hump. That's the size of the hump. That's the amount of energy it would require to make a reaction go. Right. So imagine sugar in your cupboard, and it just it's stable, right? Even though sugar breaks down over time, you can burn sugar, you can eat sugar, you can give up. It's got free energy in it. It's stable in that cupboard. Why? Because it takes a lot of activation energy to break it down, right? You'd have to light it on fire. You'd have to, you know, heat it up a lot, okay? So what enzymes do is they kind of put things into positions where just a tiny little bit of energy can set it off now, okay? Imagine taking that ball on a cliff that's over here and moving it to the point where it's just about to fall. And so its own thermal energy, maybe, or just a little wind knocks it off. Okay, so that's um, what enzymes do, is they lower that energy of activation. You see here, they bring it down, they bring it down this way. Okay? All right, so a, a, a real example of this. Let's say we had a disaccharide, like maltose. That's two glucoses together. Okay, actually, I think the next slide might have this. Let's see. No. Okay, never mind. So we have a disaccharide and it's got a covalent bond there. We need to break that covalent bond. So there's an enzyme that can bind to this thing. And when the enzyme binds to it, it binds to it in a way that it kind of stretches it a little bit. Imagine kind of stretching your back in your chair, your arch backwards, and now your back's a little bit under strain, okay, or stress. Okay, or take a stick, right? Take a single stick and then bend it. Okay, put it under some tension. What's gonna happen? It's more likely somewhere in the middle here, it's gonna snap all by itself, okay? That's what the enzyme does in this case, okay? So this would be the enzyme maltase. Maltase is the enzyme that breaks maltose down into the two glucoses, okay? So the way it does it, it bends it a bit. All right, cool. Now, the way enzymes work is they are, again, they're a protein, they have some three-dimensional shape, and they have a pocket somewhere in their shape called the active site, okay? So this is where it binds its substrate. So you can think of it this way. Here's an enzyme plus its substrate. I don't know why we keep getting these lines. Sorry about that. Enzyme and substrate, okay? And when they come together, you can call that the enzyme substrate complex, right? That's just, you know, think of a, a, a baseball mitt with a ball in it, okay? So we call this the enzyme substrate complex. That's a terrible drawing of a mitt. I apologize, um, but, you know, <laughs> there you go. Okay, and then when it's in there, it forms a product. So the enzyme now has a product in its hand, okay? And then it releases the product, so enzyme plus product. Okay, so this general mechanism is how enzymatic reactions work. Okay, um, now this is a little bit beyond the scope of the course right now, so you don't have to really worry too much about the details of how enzymes work. Um, if you're interested in it, feel free to dig in, but the, uh, the concept here is simply that enzymes um, increase the rate of reactions. And the way they do that is they bind their substrate and they speed up the reaction by lowering the energy of activation. Okay, so so in this case, the, the opposites here, you can see there's a degradation reaction. Okay, so we're substrate, there's substrate. Okay, so in this case, you can see a substrate has two pieces to it. So this would be like the maltose example. Okay, it binds to the active site. So there's the enzyme substrate complex and then the a uh, chemical reaction happens and the products are released and the enzyme goes and finds another substrate to uh, work again. Okay, in this uh, example, we now have two individual substrates that will bind to the active site. So sure, so yes, there are some active sites that can bind to multiple things. And so the two individual items, so like there's A and B that we talked about earlier, okay, make C, okay?
And so this is a building reaction. So here's my question to you. Is this an exergonic reaction or an endergonic reaction? Does it require energy or does it give off energy? Does the product have more free energy than the uh, starting point or less free energy? Which, uh, which one, the product or the substrate, has more entropy? Okay, all the concepts we've talked about really can be talked about and thought about in this slide. Okay, you don't have to worry about the induced fit model. So if you wanna just skip this slide, go ahead. But I'll just tell you this. We used to um, teach this stuff um, in a lock and key analogy where you would have the enzyme as a keyhole and the substrate would be the key. Okay, and so it would be a lock and key. The idea here was though that the key was rigid and the locks uh, mechanism inside was also rigid, but that went away. In reality, it is more like um, a baseball glove, right? Well, if you think of a baseball glove when it's open, okay, I'm trying to, this is a really bad sketch, but you can picture, here's a baseball glove, okay? And when the ball goes into the baseball glove, what happens? The, the glove kind of wraps around it more. Okay, um, I really apologize for my, my artistic skills here. They're terrible today. Um, and actually, um, in most days in PowerPoint. <laughs> but you can see anyway, the idea of the glove wrapping around the ball. We call that the induced fit model. Okay, the idea is, is that the substrate induces a change in the enzyme so that it fits better. Okay, all right. And here's the example. So you can picture this as a clamp. Okay, and so this whole area clamps down this way. Basically, as the substrate comes in, it clamps down. And you can see it kind of catches it um, in kind of a vice grip. Okay. Let's see. Um, well, so here are just some good real-world examples of some, some enzymes. Notice that the enzymes all end in ASE. Okay, that is a really good solid rule in biology. And so if you see ASE at the end of a word, that's an enzyme, and then usually the front part tells you something about its function or its substrates. It depends on who named it and when. Some of them are not very informative, some of them are extremely informative, right? Like for example, what's a lipase do? Does it build lipids or does it break lipids? We can't tell from the name, okay? In general though, in general, not always, in general, the enzyme is usually named for what it breaks. Okay, and I'm going to get in trouble for saying that someday, I'm sure, but that, that is a good rule of thumb here. Right, so we talked about maltase before. Maltase takes maltose and it breaks it down into glucose. Okay, ribonucleases are um, enzymes that take polymers of RNA and break them into the monomers. Okay, and then lactase, of course, that's the enzyme that some of us are intolerant to, or rather, I should, let me start that over again. Lactase is an enzyme that people who are lactose intolerant no longer create, okay? And so if you are lactose intolerant, the reason you're lactose intolerant is because somewhere along your life, usually from age maybe one to seven or eight, your um, body matures and shuts off the gene for lactase. And without the gene for lactase, the lactose from milk is no longer able to be digested. And so instead it goes into your stomach and from your stomach into your intestines, and there are bacteria in there that you are feeding, basically. And so they eat the lactose, they generate gas, and that's where you get your cramping and bloating from, okay? Lactate, the, uh, the, either the milk, lactate, or the, um, well, so let's talk about the milk. So lactate, the milk, the milk product in the store, that is just milk that has been pre-treated with the enzyme lactase, so that the um, sugars are no longer in there as in the form of lactose. So instead you have glucose and um, galactose. And so that's why it tastes a little sweeter. And then if you take the pills, the pills are actually um, uh, active forms of the enzyme. And so you can put some of that in your stomach for a bit and you can enjoy your ice cream or your, um, or your cheese or your yogurt or what have you. Okay, all right. All right, there are some um, basic factors that control enzymes, all right? So if you picture an enzyme like a machine, okay? And the machine might have some levers and some buttons and switches on it, okay? Most, most machines, right? I mean, just think about it. Most machines, we don't want it to be on all the time or off all the time. We want to turn it on when we need it and turn it off when we don't, okay? Sometimes we want machines to go really fast. Sometimes we're going to go slower, 
Um, so it's fall. Think of your leaf blower. Okay, it's sitting in your garage or your parents' garage, and it's off. And then when we turn it on, there's maybe a low speed and a high speed. Okay, and so depending on the job we're doing with the enzyme, depending on how much product we need, depending on how much substrate's available, we want that enzyme to do its job differently. Okay, and there's very simple ways to control that. And we've already talked about this in the lab. So we, the ones I really want you to focus on are temperature and pH. Okay, don't worry about the, um, the concentration of substrates and reactants. Those are like kind of intuitive. Okay, so uh, temperature increases the rate of reaction up until the point of denaturation and then it collapses. pH, on the other hand, all enzymes have a favorite pH. And whatever that pH is, if it gets lower or higher in the solution that the enzyme is in, the reaction rate will slow down. Okay, so this is the rate of the reaction, and this is, in this case, pH, rate of the reaction, and this is temperature. Okay, now, yes, you can kind of see that the temperature curve and the pH curve look similar, right? But don't be um, confused. This is um, increasing uh, temperature and increasing reactivity. Okay, whereas in this case, we... Um, Okay, fine. They're, they're similar enough here. This is really what temperature looks like. It goes more like this. Okay, it's got a steep curve to it, whereas most of the pH curves have a very evenly distributed bell curve. Okay, so here I'll make them even more extreme. Temperature, pH. Okay, this is that point of degradation, of uh, denaturation, due to the enzymes, um, tertiary structure denaturing, falling apart. Okay. All right, cofactors, cofactors are things that help enzymes. Okay, so like you could think of ATP as a cofactor. Okay, um, sometimes a simple magnesium ion or an iron ion, or calcium, manganese. These are all uh, zinc. These are all um, single atoms that help some enzymes do their work. Okay. All right, again, um, this is just general. The idea being that the more starting material you have, the faster the enzyme goes. It's pretty straightforward. All right, and I already talked about these enough, and we did a lab at this point, so I'm going to skip this for now. Okay, there's your temperature curve. And you can see, again, the, uh, the right side here is a little bit more uh, steeper than the left. Okay. And in this case, you can see two enzymes, pepsin and trypsin, how each of them have different pHs. Why is this important? Why do you think, why does it matter um, that we have enzymes that have completely different pHs? So I want you to consider, you got a cell, okay? You have all these different compartments in the cell and each of these compartments do different things, right? So you can imagine now the enzymes in one compartment, if they accidentally spill out into some other area, we don't want them doing their job. Okay, a really simple example is, here's a cell, here's a nucleus, here's a lysosome. Remember what lysosomes do? Right, lysosomes are filled with hydrolytic enzymes. They break things down. So you can imagine if a lysosome lyses and those enzymes fall out into the cytoplasm, if they weren't stopped by a decrease in, or a change in pH, if they weren't stopped by a change in pH, they would eat the cell, right? You would start digesting it. It, it would start digesting itself. And that would be bad. All right, so this is a way of containing and regulating enzymes in, in different chambers of the cell, so to speak. Okay, now some enzymes are off by, by um, default and we have to activate them. All right, so again, this is like putting a little energy into your mower or plugging in your leaf blower or whatever. Kinases, you can see kine for kinetic, right? So kinetic energy, the energy of movement, right? So kinases, are an entire class or family of proteins that take ATP, and sometimes they take another one, GTP, but you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so they take ATP and they phosphorylate, that's the idea here, they phosphorylate their substrate and they give it some energy, so then they can go and do some work, okay? All right, so we can also shut enzymes off, and there's basically two ways to do that, uh, simply put. There is, here, let's see the pictures here. Okay, so hold on, let me just jump ahead really quick. We'll do, we'll do this one first. No, we'll do, 
There's no real picture here the first time, so I'll have to make one. All right, so here, we got Pac-Man, okay? And Pac-Man eats these triangles. And so you can see this triangle fits perfectly into the active site right here. But let's say that there was some other substance that looked like a triangle too, and it could compete with that active site. Okay, so we would call this a competitive inhibitor because they both compete for the same site. In contrast, okay, now let's give let's give uh, Pac-Man some kind of tail area. Okay, and here's this substrate. Now let's imagine that there was something that combined on this side. And I realize these all look like triangles, so let me change let me change the shape here. Let's say this one's kind of a curve. Okay, and then that's a triangle. All right, so we have a substrate that binds to the active site, and then we have something over here that binds to this other site, literally other site. Allosteric means other site. So the allosteric site is the site in which an enzyme will have its inhibitor bind to it. Now, notice the inhibitor is not competing with the substrate anymore. So we call this non-competitive inhibition, okay? All right. All right, so you can see in this case, we have the, um, so A binding to enzyme one, right? So this, this is the active site of the enzyme. Don't worry about this right now, but this is the active site, okay? And now you can see A gets turned to B, gets turned to C, to D, to D, and then we have F. And now F can go back here and bind to the original enzyme, the first one in the process, and bind to it. And what that does is it prevents it from binding to A. So it shuts it off. Okay, so you can see here, here's enzyme one from the original reaction here. Okay, so here's enzyme one, and then this is the product F from the original one. Okay, so you can see as F binds to enzyme one, what does it do to the active site? Well, if you look at this slide, the active site looks like this. Okay, but when it's bound to F, what does it do? It kind of crunches up a little bit. The mouth closes, and it prevents the uh, reactant from coming in. Okay, so as long as the inhibitor is bound the active site changes shape and it prevents the enzyme from working. Okay. Now this idea of an enzyme having its product, I'm sorry, a pathway, the pathways product blocking the first step. This is called feedback inhibition. Okay. So we have a pathway and then the product comes back and shuts it off. And what this does is it's a really nice way of regulating um, any pathway really where you don't want to make too much of something. You want to make just enough of it. And so this is a way of regulating that. All right, we talked about cofactors earlier. Cofactors are things that help enzymes do their job. And they can either be organic or inorganic. Okay, the examples I gave you before are things like zinc or magnesium or iron. Okay, these are little ions that sit in the middle or a pocket of an enzyme and help it stick to things or bind to things. Sometimes, though, enzymes can have organic Co uh, cofactors. Okay, and we'll learn in the next chapter, we'll learn about um, NAD and FADH and NADP. I know these are all acronyms that mean nothing to you right now, but these things are basically really, really strong hot plates or buckets that can hold a lot of energy. Okay, and because they're complicated in organic molecules, but they're not proteins, we call them coenzymes. Okay, so cofactors are simple things like magnesium or manganese. Coenzymes are complicated organic molecules that have some kind of shape to them. Okay? Another example of a coenzyme, of course, are vitamins. So vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin A, all the vitamins you take, these are vital amines. These are vital organic molecules that have amino groups to them. That's what the word vitamin comes from. Okay? And so vitamins um, usually um, are coenzymes. All right, I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to upload this, and then tonight I will conclude with part three, where we talk about redox. Okay, and actually, let me just take a quick look ahead here. Um, oh, you know what? I'll, I'll finish up here. Let's let's just deal with redox. Um, so, redox is probably one of the harder uh, concepts uh, most students have uh, uh, challenges with, but I'm going to try to make it uh, as simple as possible. So, redox is really two words. Um, reduction oxidation. Okay, so reduction oxidation. Okay, now what do these have to do with? It has to do with the flow of energy through a system. Okay, you have electrons, and electrons can either be hot or cold. Right, so you can have a really, really high energy electron, a really, really cold electron. Okay, 
And regardless if they're hot or cold or high or low in energy, we can imagine there's some substance, A, that has an electron on it. Okay, there's some, some electron. And then there's substance B, and somehow or another, through some mechanism we won't worry about right now, A gives its enzyme, um, enzyme sorry, <laughs> its electron to B, such that we now have A here without its electron, and B over here with an extra electron now, right? Now think about electrons for a minute. They're negatively charged. So if A starts out neutral, and then it loses its electron, what happens to its electric charge? If you think it gets positive, you're right. So A becomes A plus. And then B, because B is neutral, let's say, and gains an electron, gains a negative charge, B's charge is now negative. So you would say that B is reduced. So that's what reduction is. Okay. So you would say, re oops, reduction is the gain of an electron. Okay, you could think of that as rig. Reduction is gain. Okay, now, we've talked a lot about oxygen this semester. Oxygen loves electrons. Oxygen is very electronegative. That means it loves bringing in electrons. Okay, and so, in general, because oxygen does this the most, when A loses its electron, we call that oxidation. Okay, so we would say oxidation is loss. Okay, and a way to remember that is the word oil. Now put them together, what do you get? Oil rig. Okay, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. Okay, now when we talk about cell respiration and photosynthesis, those are basically really complex systems where we start, so let's do photosynthesis first, we start with something Okay, and we're going to watch electrons move from it and go uphill, and those high energy electrons now are going to find themselves in sugar, glucose. Okay, so we're going to take cooled off electrons from water, and we're going to watch as we pump sunlight into this, we're going to bring it uphill, uphill, uphill until we get into glucose. So those electrons go from low energy, oops, those electrons go from low energy to high energy. Okay, through a series of redox reactions where the electrons are constantly lost and gained and lost and gained and lost and gained until finally they're out in glucose. Then we eat glucose, right? What do we do? We extract the energy out of it. How? By pulling energy out of those high energy electrons by having them get lost and gained and lost and gained and lost and gained and lost and gained to the point where they find themselves cooled off in water again. How? Well, remember, you breathe oxygen in. And that oxygen plus some electrons and then protons are floating around everywhere, we call them H+, plus. they form water, okay? So those two concepts, photosynthesis, which is taking the energy in water, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, taking the low energy electrons from, a water, uh, from water, pumping them full of energy and storing them into glucose, and then taking glucose and making it fall back down again. Okay, so these series of redox reactions, and there's going to be some complexity to these, you can think of these simply put as one big system that is endergonic, gaining energy, okay, coupled to one big system that is exergonic, losing energy, okay? And we'll talk about those in the next few chapters. All right, another example we talked about, um, if you remember ionic bonds in chapter two, chlorine steals the electron from sodium, right? Steals that electron. And so chlorine becomes negatively charged. You would say chlorine is reduced, okay? So again, so sodium loses its electron to chlorine. So sodium is oxidized, it's now positively charged, and chlorine is reduced, it's negatively charged. Right. Do you see now why we have to call it redox? Because we can't have one without the other. You always need both. You need a reduction and oxidation step. Okay? Okay, now, as we said earlier, the energy that we're dealing with is usually trapped inside an electron. Okay? And in biological solutions, there's always a few protons laying around. Okay, now, why is he writing H plus and calling it a proton? Well, remember, 
hydrogen is just one proton surrounded by, you can say, two electrons. Okay? And really, hydrogen is only ever found as H2. We have a system of two hydrogens. Um, why? Because that single proton, that single proton, that first shell, that first shell, it, the first shell holds two electrons. And so those two electrons are shared by both of them. And so we get that's H2. Okay? So in biological systems, we have a lot of H floating around. And of course, if it's dissociated, we can now say, it lo if it loses its electron, rather, it's just H plus, right? And we call that just a proton, okay? So electrons plus protons, you can think of as just hydrogen, okay? So in general, when something has hydrogens in it, you can think of it as having a lot of energy. Watch this, C6, H12, O6, who's that? You might say that's generic hexose, that's a hexose sugar, that's glucose, okay? I mean, it could be glucose or it could be, what are the other two? Right, fructose or fructose and galactose. Well, what do they do all? They all have these hydrogens here, okay? And so in photosynthesis, we're going to see C6H12O6. We're going to watch as we take the energy in these covalent bonds and have them fall downhill, and we're gonna land in, um, Hold on, let me think for a minute. I, my mind just went blank, sorry. Ugh, okay, we have carbon dioxide and oxygen gas. Oh, 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 haha, ha. let me do this again. There's glucose, c 6 o 6 Okay, what we do, we take glucose, okay, and we breathe in some water. Oh, <laughs> we don't breathe water, and we breathe oxygen in. Okay, so we breathe in some oxygen, we take, when we eat some sugar, and what happens? Okay, the hydrogen you can think of as falling downhill and landing on the oxygen. And what does that do? That yields good old H2O. To balance the equations, there's a six. Okay, and to balance the equations, there's a six. So there's six oxygens, one molecule of sugar. Okay, so what happens when we remove all of the, the, the energy? Well, what are we left with? There's the carbon and the oxygen. Well, there's your CO2, and of course, six of those. Okay, all right. So um, what the book basically says here is you can think of oxidation as the loss of hydrogen atoms. All right, so if you see six, C6H12O6 going down to carbon dioxide and water, okay, you can see because it's losing its, um, because it's losing its hydrogens, it's getting oxidized, okay? Um, and we're gonna, I'm going to skip these slides. These are really for the next chapters. Um, so I'm not going to ask you any questions on this test about mitochondria and photosynthesis because we're going to spend the next uh, two weeks talking about these things. Okay. All right. And then so that concludes the um, second part and final part of the uh, chapter six lecture. Um, be sure you read this or rather listen to this and take some notes and email me some study questions. Um, and at the very least, uh, give me feedback. I'm always up for uh, improving these lectures and getting some feedback from you guys. All right, thanks a lot and uh, see you soon.